Amen. Good morning. How are y'all? All right. Who besides me loves summer? I mean, except for the heat. Nobody likes summer. All the kids. Well, we got we got two people down here that get to sleep, right? So we like summer. We have all kinds of stuff. Hopefully, y'all get some vacations. Y'all can have some, uh, you know, funny. Y'all can go ahead and sit down too. By the way, I saw Jennifer sitting there with a bay. I feel bad. Sit down, please, Jennifer. You don't have to. <laughs> but yeah, we have a lot going on at the Stubbs house. Um, actually, uh, Wednesday, Evie and I celebrated 26 years of marriage. So if you need, yeah, 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 yeah. If you need any proof of grace, go look at my wife. Not only the fact that she loves serving um, her faith family's kids every week in the nursery, um, she's been putting up with me for, for 26 years. So there's perfect evidence that God's grace is alive and well. And it was funny because as we kind of ate a really good filet at Fleming's, we look back at 26 years and we kind of chuckled at just how naive and dumb we were when we got married. Um, we kind of had this okay time. We're like, okay, uh, when were we less than happy with each other? I guess that's how I'll say it in church. There was a little bit stronger language, things that we did. Um, and then we kind of did that, hey, let's, let's be thankful for where we are in life, how healthy we are, where God's blessings are. And then we kind of played the game. Like, where do you see, where do you see ourselves in 10 years? You know, what, what's going to happen? Which kid's going to have, you know, a, a, a grandchild first, this game, you know, and we did all this, and it was an awesome time. But I thought about this as we look back. June 7th, 1997 was a day for both of us that changed our identity. And second to the day of our salvation for each of us, that day that changed our identity, identity impacted our lives more than anything else. Why? Because we were single, and now we're married, right? And we're joined together. So everything that Evie and I do from that day forward change. The decision-making process comes through mutual affirmation and assurance, comes through mutual love, mutual sacrifice. There's a lot of things that I used to do that I don't get to do, and there's a lot of things she probably used to do that she liked that she doesn't get to do. That's called mutual sacrifice. But our identity changed. And as we dive into Romans 5, I want us to understand this one thing. Identity is very, very powerful. Why do you say that? Just think about this with me for a second. Identity tells you who you are and whose you are. And once we understand who our identity is and, and what we're supposed to be doing, it's going to drive and change everything. And so at the heart of what Paul is going to be telling us is, is that justification is our identity. Look at the last words of, of uh, chapter 4 with me that Jared finished up last week. Who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our what? For our justification, right? And then he picks up and he goes, therefore, since we have been justified. So everything that he's built up in the first four chapters that Russell just went through is going to hinge on this one therefore. And what the therefore is going to show us is just how powerful recognizing as a Christian what justification actually means for us to be declared not guilty. It's a legal declaration from God. And so we're going to look at that in chapter 5, um, verses 1 through 11. We're going to roll with that, and you're going to see in the first two verses, what we're going to see is is that justification is going to shape us. We're going to look at three tenses of justification. We're going to look at the past, we're going to look at the present, and we're going to look at the future. Then we're going to have, I don't know if any of y'all realize, y'all are going to do a little mini, um, y'all signed up for a, a, a mini uh, sermon series or on Christian development today, but you're going to get that as well in three through five. And then we're going to have two application points, and this is powerful. So let's roll through those things. So Paul says in verses one and two, and I'm going to read them, that Christ's justifying work on the cross shapes us at the core of who we are. Chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So first, the past tense, justification gives us a peace with God despite our past sins. Now, before we jump into that, peace with God 
is different than the peace of God. We also get the peace of God as justified, but the peace of God allows us to go and enter a world and have peace between things that we encounter. And that's good, and that's part of grace, and that's beautiful, but the genesis of having the peace of God in our lives is what? Having the peace with God in our lives. And peace with God is this. It's the end of our religious battle. Russell, great job, whoever did psalm selection. It's this way. We just sang it. Perfect, Josh, well done, sir. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst in my sight. So when you think about what peace with God means, it means that this battle that started way back in the Garden of Eden with this idea that we as people can be kind of the, the captain of our own fate and we can kind of do our own thing and get away with it while we internally know God's looking at us and we feel his presence in this whole battle of sin in our life versus God's unfailing love. This battle that's been going on and on and on forever, the work of the cross finally conquers that in our lives. It's a battle that we give into. And there's a picture that I want to show you guys because to me, it's critical for us to think through this. Because to me, the whole word here is submission. But I think even surrender is even a little bit deeper picture. I'm a huge history buff. This is actually one of the first pictures that came back from Normandy that day. But what you're seeing is, is you are seeing disarmed German soldiers who are asking for peace and truth. They have put down the arms and they have, they've, they've, they've got away from the grenades and the mortars that were, were forcing the onslaught on Omaha Beach and all the things. And they have said, arms down, hands up, our wills, we, we are not gonna fight you. You are an overwhelming force and we have surrendered unto you. Perfect submission. All is at rest. That is what justification happens, and it occurs in the life of an individual when they look at what God has done through Jesus Christ on the cross. They hear it. They understand it. The Holy Spirit throws all that together, and they go, oh, this overwhelming force is here, but it's not Americans with guns. It's even better. Go back to that picture if you don't mind for a second, Josh. Even better, he conquers us not with forces that hurt us, but he conquers us with forces that hurt him. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 is one of the most beautiful pictures of that. So before we go any further, this is challenging me as I'm preaching this, and it should challenge every one of us. We have to understand the beginning of our faith is this. And I want us to pause just for a second and look at this analogy in our own lives. Have we come to God like this? Every picture coming before God is with empty hands and raised hands. Have we come, have we, have we put the things that have been ours, that we know our little sins or our little devices or our little thoughts or whatever it is that's man-made that that's in our personality that we want to justify, that we kind of keep in these private corners that we think are hidden away from God? Have we dropped those things? And do we approach God fully surrendered? That's a challenge for us. We just sing that, and it's a beautiful thing to sing. Justification starts when we get that that is what the Christian faith is, right? Christian faith isn't just adding church like we add piano lessons and kind of come in here and try to get and compartmentalize. Christian faith begins with this whole idea that the gospel is beautiful. Grace is incredible. But justification comes and we're like, you're right, you got me, God. All that junk that is up in the trunk from the past, I'm going to pour it out. And you're not going to look at that anymore because Jesus has done better and I'm ready to trade. So I'm coming at you and I ain't got nothing to bring. My arms are down. My pet sins are down. Even though I'm not going to be perfect in them, the battle between me and you, God, is over. 
We have to let that sink in. We can't rush past that. Paul really wants that to sink in because if we can't get over the past sins, we're not going to have any peace in our lives. And if we don't have any peace in our lives, then there's no way that we're going to be able to operate in grace, right? Think about this. You look at almost any march that's going on. What do they yell? No peace, no justice. No justice, what? No peace. Paul says, y'all are close. What Paul's saying is, is actually no justification, no peace. So I just want to encourage y'all, as a brother in Christ, take time today and tomorrow and every day just to think about the value of not being at war with God. Value the peace that you have with God because that is the beginning of our identity. If we rush through that, we're going to miss it, right? So embrace past sins forgiven as far as the East is from the West. Embrace that identity as a child of God. Amen? So that's the past, right? Okay, so what else does it do? In verse 2, it's going to grant us access to this grace for today. And you know, as I thought about how do you unpack this, I want to just be kind of come clean. Some of y'all may have some quirky, weird habits like me. Does anybody have quirky, weird habits? Y'all can raise your hand for your spouse or friend. Madura Russell does. Well, I'm going to share one with y'all because when we travel abroad, I always put all of our passports in this inside protective cover right here, right? And so I do it, I'm checking them, you know, I'm usually tired, I got all six and the kids are running around. So I put them all in there and I make sure that I got them. And then we kind of get on the plane and we get about halfway to where we're going. And this little thing comes in my brain from nowhere and it goes, you sure those passports are there? You know, what, what if they kind of jumped out or somebody stole them or while, you know, the, the airport steward just got them, what, what if y'all get to where you're going and you don't have a passport? What's going to happen? And so fear and doubt creep into my mind. And so I take it out, and I look, and I dig it out, and I put it back. I'm like, okay, I got them. So then I put them back in, and I kind of make sure my feet are on top of it. So if I go to sleep, you know, they're not going to jump out or whatever else. But the whole point about this is what I want to make. We can be absolutely certain that those passports are in that pocket, but yet fear and doubt cause us to doubt our blessed assurance, right? That can happen all the time. And what we have to realize as saved Christians, the adversary is trying to cast the fear and doubt for one reason. He doesn't want us to walk as confident Christians full of blessed assurance. Why is that? Because when we walk like that, other people go, I want what they got. I want to end that rebellion that the devil won't do, and that is what faith is, right? And so think about it. Our life as a justified Christian often looks like that. We can be super confident of our identity in him, but when we go through life, we kind of get shaken sometimes. We've got to pull out the, the pocket of our salvation, kind of dig up that seed of Jesus in our spiritual lives and look at it to make sure it's, okay, yeah, I know I'm saved. Put it back, right? That's what the adversary wants to do. We have to understand this. What he's saying in verse 2 is that we have access to this grace, and a couple of pictures that I want to do this, I don't know if any of y'all have done yard work lately, but when you have a day out in the yard or you're working out whatever, and you're just grimy and greasy and you got dirt all over, and you come in and that shower, whew, that shower comes in and it's hot and it's warm, and you see all the yuck and everything, and you get refreshed. Y'all, we have a 24-7, 365 access pipeline to this beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ that he wants to pour out on us all the time. And grace just doesn't forgive our past sins, y'all. Grace, if you really look at what Paul's saying here, his language really means, it means it also brings you near to God. He wants to encourage us, remember, grace not only covers and changes our lives, it pulls us from where we don't belong as paupers into the palace, into the throne room. Grace is this phenomenal access, and you're like, well, why is that so important? The important thing is this, is tomorrow, there's going to be times when each of us are probably by ourselves or maybe with somebody else, and fear or doubt or anxiety or we're going to get a bad call or something is going to rattle our cage. And we have to understand at that point in time, number one, we are not alone. 
Think about that. Access to grace is not just forgiving your sins. It's amazing grace, and that is clear. But I want this justification, this power of this access to sit heavy on us. Tomorrow, let that sit on you, friend. It's going to happen sometime this week. And God is with you through the work of his son. He loves you that so much. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows you by name. He calls a rebel idiot like me, friend. That's a crazy love, a crazy, crazy type of love. That's an infectious love. That is available, but we have to draw on it, right? So draw near to God in that, and he'll draw near to you. So justification, past sins, justification, access to grace is important, but what about tomorrow, okay? Verse 2, it's going to grow a certain joyous hope for tomorrow. I got tickled this past week at Luke, who was so excited his first day of football practice that he was actually semi-looking forward to getting up at 5.45 a.m. He was fired up, right? And and so just a little background here, um, Luke getting excited to wake up at 5.45 in the morning would be like me getting excited if y'all invited me, no offense if you're big opera marathon people, but if you said, you know, if Ed goes, hey, me and Allie, we got tickets to a three-day opera marathon and it's all you can eat, Brussels sprouts and asparagus. I'd be like, hey, that's great. I got to rotate my tires. Like, short notice, it ain't going to happen, as evidenced by me prying out of bed today at 8.55 to make church, right? But the cool thing about it was this, because he looked forward to what was going to happen in anticipation to something good in his life, his mindset about getting up early was totally different, right? Does that make sense? Church, nothing is going to make tomorrow or the next day or the day after that more encouraging and more joyous and have a hope-filled mindset is if we approach it through a mindset of justification in our hope in Jesus Christ. And the hope he's talking about here isn't like some hope upon a star. It really is best translated a hope-filled certainty. Or even better, it's just a certainty that just hasn't been realized in our lives. Because Paul's saying this, he's saying to Chad, and he's saying to everybody at Tapestry, he's like, look, y'all, go forward in life with this joy that your past sins are covered. I'm with you, and we're going to do some fun, awesome stuff, even though you're going to suffer in the process. Joy is going to underpin all of it. And church, if we are able, and when the church begins to operate like that, that is when they did in Acts and said they did what? They turned the world upside down. The only thing that we can bring to the weapon of the battlefield of war is everything we get through Jesus Christ and our justification and the Holy Spirit coming out. All these other things we try to bring, our psychoanalysis, how smart we are, all these other things we can try to do, devoid of everything that starts with the genesis of our justification is going to fall flat. Amen? All right. So we got past, we got present, and now we got the future, okay? So with all of that wrapped up together, um, I just got to confess, you know, the truth about it for me is there's a lot of times where I don't look forward to things maybe as brightly as I should. Is anybody else with me? Hey, it's good to repent. We, we can, oh, we got two back there. We got everybody else is perfect in that, so glad y'all's assurance really is blessed. But I think it's important just to think about that. Why do we allow those things and those challenges and those things that frustrate us overpower Jesus' power in our life? Why do we choose to believe that lie? And it is a choice for us. It's a matter of us going back to that surrender, right? And I know I'm not alone because we live in the most prosperous culture ever in the history of man, yet sleeplessness, anxiety, and worry, all time highs. Y'all, we have to realize no matter how much we believe all the stuff and all the goodness and all these things can cover up for the deep issues of our soul, they just can't, right? So moving forward, we got to believe God has good for tomorrow in us, even though when we look at our schedule, we're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do all those meetings. Ah, I don't want to have to do all those things. We can't look at it that way. We got to go, you know what? God's goodness in my past, 
is proof to me that his goodness in my future is only a day away. And when we can move forward, standing on his word, living as a child of promise, that's solid ground that can make us smile. And I will tell you this, this is my biggest struggle in my life. This is my single biggest struggle. I got to, I'm not going to go through everything I got to worry, worry about. Well, short list, Allison's in Spain, Cal's over here, these kids are everywhere, is, there, you know, is the economy crashing, how divisive is the world, all these things. And we can start, I can start to look forward with a work week like pressure one, pressure two, pressure three, pressure four. All these things are spinning tops. And if I'm not careful, I can think I'm the one trying to control it all. I'm going to be honest, often I get there. Paul is saying, as a justified Christian, that ain't your role. That ain't your role. You worry about what God wants to do in you. You listen to the Holy Spirit's path in your life, and then you walk, Chad. You walk as a child of promise, certain that even though there's going to be ups and downs, and there are big ups and downs, and I'm not saying there aren't certain things to have concern over. There's a lot in my life to have concern over. But he's saying, let Jesus take that anxiety off of us. Amen? All right. So with the firm grasp with our identity, Paul is now going to welcome us into this little mini seminar on Christian development. This is one of my favorite little uh, scripture verses because there's not a lot of things that I like processes. You know, I know Leighton does as well. He's a process-driven guy for sure. So I've talked to him about what he does for a living. But for people like us, sometimes I need kind of like a little track to go back and review my progress and milestone, right? So he's going to welcome us. He's going to say, you know what? He's going to say something that's really, really kind of weird to us. And to me, it, it sounds a little weird when you think about it. He says, now that we've done all that, he says in verse 3, now we rejoice in our sufferings. Wow, that's kind of an interesting little thing to to think through. And so, Josh, if you go to that slide that's got what happens when we rejoice in our sufferings, he says, knowing that suffering produces endurance. So here we go on this little track, right? Endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Now, first, we've got to clarify, Paul doesn't say, hey, rejoice that you're suffering. He doesn't say, hey, Sammy, something's really bad. Rejoice about that suffering. He's not some kind of masochist saying, hey, just because something's terrible is happening to you, everything's great. Enjoy that. What he's saying is this. He's saying, why should Christians joy in their suffering? That's a great question. And Paul answered very clearly in this text. He says, because suffering is going to be the genesis for your transformation. We actually become most like Christ when we carry our own cross, right? Does that make sense? And when we suffer with the joy of the Lord, there's something in our lives that people see that doesn't make sense. You can't get there through worldly logic when you're like, oh, and Caleb, he's having a terrible time, but yet somehow, some way, he is giving glory to the Lord in his walk. That's a beautiful thing. It's, it's the same thing we see in Jesus. And a lot of times we look at that and we go, why does God use suffering? And I can say this, I can testify for me, it is the thing in my life where God kind of Loose suffering loosens my illusionary grip on the steering wheel of life that thinks I'm in control, right? Does that make sense? Suffering is used, and God's using it in my life, and I believe what this text is telling us, it's not only the genesis of the transformation, it is the very thing that God is going to do to take our hands off this illusion of self-reliance and go, okay, now, now that Chad's not trusting in himself, I can actually do something with that knucklehead right? That's what he's saying. And suffering has been and biblically always is a genesis of something that's beautiful, you know? And you're saying, okay, well, why would he do all that? Does it make sense? Well, not only does he drop our self-reliance, but he also does this. It, it, it helps us to be fragile. It helps us to be humble. Everything that the world, it's the opposite of everything the world tells you. No, you make a self-resume, you have a self-appearance, you be self-reliant, you be self-assured, you be self-this, you be self-that. The world is trying to pump us up day by day, post by post, like by like, email by email, compliment by compliment, share by share. It's trying to puff us up. 
like a little bitty frog trying to get bigger, right? And suffering in an instant can come and just pop it. And when we're fragile and we're humble, we're shapeable and we're moldable. And really in today's society, being humble and shapeable and moldable is about as rare as a Vanderbilt SEC football championship. Forgive me if there's any Vanderbilt football fans in here. Um, I'm an Auburn fan. We've been suffering with you, so I know what I'm talking about. But I'm just saying it's rare. And God's got to get us humble, moldable, shapeable, and he does that through suffering. And so until we suffer, we're not ready to go through this transformation process, right? So Paul makes it clear, suffering, where that's going to start. And then look what he says. He says, suffering produces endurance. And endurance here really means not only going through this suffering, sticking with it, but it really means a single-mindedness, a single-mindedness back to that justification, a single-mindedness back to the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, and the product of our faith, justification. So that suffering hits us, boom, object of faith, product of faith, ready to rock and roll. It draws us back in the biggest analogy I would draw to this. It's kind of like teenagers. I've had four of them, still got two of them, and I love them. And I love that they get this independent street with them. And so as you go through that, if you haven't, what it is is, you know, sometimes they think they're not as dependent as they really are. They maybe get a little ahead of themselves, and they don't come as close as they used to, and they kind of lose this idea that they're still under our roof and our care need to get permission from us to do things. I um, won't give any names right in through here, but I did it too, right? We all did it. But what happens when that cool, growing young man who knows what he needs to do has a fever? The mom that just wanted a hug or a thank or the dad who just wanted, you know, something to do, all of a sudden, that child can't get out of bed. That child is totally reliant. The single mind is, oh yeah, I, I'm still not my own man. I'm still not grown up. I still really need my mom. I do believe that's what Paul is saying here is that endurance. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> that endurance here, that single mindedness that suffering does, that endurance, it puts us back and it pushes us back into Jesus's arms in some new and fresh ways that are super cool. And that only happens when we're suffering and suffering is going to produce endurance, and endurance is going to produce character. Verse 4. Character here is clearly pointing towards the Christ-like character as the flesh is torn down and the spirit thrives. Any of y'all remember John 3.30? It's one of my life verses. It's John the Baptist saying that, what? Exactly. It's exactly right. And that's what Paul's calling us back to. I got to decrease. He's got to increase. And really, I love this word here, the Greek word here, really means it's battle-tested. This justification, this idea that we've talked about, it's getting battle-tested. And I think about this all the time because I think this is so true. When sufferings, and if you're in the middle of suffering right now, or if you're trying to find joy in just a mediocre life that you don't have Christ-like glory in, I want you to remember this. You become what you behold. And I've got a picture that I want us to look at because I did this all the time. It's, it's something in us. You become what you behold. How many of y'all, when y'all were little, used to watch? We didn't have anything else to do, so don't make fun of me. Y'all have a lot more stuff, and I'm getting old. But all we had was like TBS, and I used to love Batman. You know, everybody else, you know, they argue. They think Superman's better. Everybody knows Batman's better. We'll leave it at that. Anyhow, we'd watch that, and I would, come, and I would get a cape, right? Like, I'd watch enough Batman, and he would cool. He'd be saving Gotham, doing all this kind of stuff. And so I would go get a blue towel and get, you know, little clothespins and put it on and run around. Why was I doing that? Because I was seeing Batman do cool stuff. Batman had the identity that, man, he was good. He was knocking stuff out. He was saving Gotham. You know, all the hot girls liked him. I'm a little asterisk right there. I've got a confessional here. But the truth about it was, is Batman was doing some cool stuff. We become what we behold. And what Paul is saying right here, in the middle of all this world going around, Christian, tapestry, Chad, what are you looking at? Are you looking at the object of our faith, Jesus Christ and him crucified, and the product of our faith, 
our justification, our reconciliation due to his substitution in our place? Or are we looking at something else? And we all know there's times that we can go look at the something else and we look at the something else. That's when anxiety sprouts, sleeplessness sprouts, everything else sprouts. I can justify I've done it guilty. But you know what? That doesn't mean I'm still not justified. <laughs> It still means I'm covered. It still means he has hope in me. We've got to realize this. It's crazy that God has hope in us. We're talking about, well, why should we hope in God? A better question is, why should he have hope in Chad? I mean, good grief, I'd have given up on me a long time ago. And that's how beautiful grace is. So remember that endurance in our lives, even if it's just a mundane, scratchy life, even if there's not terrible things going on, maybe you're just having a hard time seeing the kingdom and where your role in it. Remember this, you're going to become what you behold. Stop looking at the wrong thing. Stop obsessing about the wrong thing. Stop looking at ourselves. Look at Jesus, the one who loves us. Four and five, last thing, character produces hope. As we become more like Jesus by the work of the Holy Spirit, as we become what we behold and we understand and we walk through these certain things, and if you've been a Christian for long, God has taken you faithfully through some hard stuff. Once you start going through that, you really walk in life with much more certainty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's, it's, it's not a theory. It's not like, hey, one of these days, God's going to do something good and prove Like No, no, no. We're able to look back with the certain delivered promise of hope for the faithful in our own lives. And that's the best predictor of his gospel certainty for today and tomorrow in our lives. So we walk around like, okay, this is not something that I am wishfully desiring is going to happen. Like, I'm expecting it. I'm expecting that character of Christ in us through the influence of the Holy Spirit gives us this gospel hope. And gospel hope is going to drive us forward expecting God's best, even when we're experiencing the world's worst. And I'm going to say that because I think that's the, the whole genesis and kind of the end point of everything that Paul wants us to at least get through my thick skull. I hope this is having some edifying effect on y'all's walk. But gospel hope is going to drive us forward in life, expecting God's best. At some point in the way, it's not immediate relief. This isn't minute rice. God's never told me or you or anybody else that everything is going to be better every way all the time. It surely didn't work out for the disciples that way. It surely didn't work out temporarily for Jesus. But back to it, carrying that cross with the joy of the Lord set before him, he endured the shame. Why? For the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If we have no joy in the Lord, maybe it's because we have no firm conviction of our own justification, and maybe it's because we see suffering as a punishment. And there are times where our sin is going to provide some consequences, and I'm not talking about that. But our view of our identity is really a reflection of how we view God, amen? Do you think he's a good God that loves you? That's important. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. Two major application points down here in 6 through 11. So I'm going to read this for us real quick and just kind of think through that. So we've talked about our identity, past, present, future, how important that is. We've talked about what Christian development looks like. And I will say this, I would encourage you to go back and read that because when I was first saved, I'm a rabid learner. I love to read. I love to outline. I love to do these things. I love to be a high performance type of guy. And I was under the false belief, and don't hear me wrong, Bible study is critical. Theology is critical. All that's critical. But if you want to look at what the Bible says, how God is actually going to mature a believer, he's going to take all those as raw ingredients, and then he's going to pull you through suffering. He's going to pull you through perseverance, endurance, character, and then hope. So that's how we're going to grow, right? That's how we're going to take all of those things and make all those ingredients be a, a Christ-filled hope sandwich. Two application points, and then we're done. Verse 6. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, 
much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. A couple of things, two application points. Take all that, walk away, and we've got three questions. God's timing is always perfect. At just the right time, when God decided it was right for Jesus to come down on the cross and be saved, he did that at the perfect timing. God's timing is always perfect in the narrative of human redemptive history. I do not know what you are going through. I do not know what problems or what weights you have on your soul right now. God does. And as Christians, with a hope-filled certainty, we have to walk forward in faith, believe in this one thing. He is orchestrating all of those circumstances, your victories and your sufferings, your challenges and your wins and your losses and your wishes. And he is doing all that for one thing. He's organizing it because he is going to do something beautiful in your life. And he's going to do it at just the right time. Do not let the devil convince you that God has given up on you. God is with you. He's going to do something perfect at just the right time. Never forget that as a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to slow this down a little bit because it's kind of a, a really weird thought that just hit me. If we experience his love, even when we were rebels, how much more grace should we experience as a son, a daughter of Jesus Christ? Now, we think about grace moving from rebellious sinner doomed to hell to son or daughter conversion, praise God and save for that, yes. And that's a conversion, that's a, that's a justification, that's a eternally declared beautiful thing. Not guilty, Chad. You can be with me. But as a son or daughter, if, if we were in our stupid rebellion as I was and fighting against God, somehow he enabled me to experience that grace, how much more should I know that now that it's all available and now that I'm justified, now the Holy Spirit's in me, all those things are working in our favor. How much more should we experience God's grace now that we're reconciled? Buzz Lightyear would say, to infinity and beyond. I would just say, if his innocent blood covers our guilt and his wrongful death pays our price, his spirit is placed into us for one reason, to gain that deeper access day by day. Our new creation really is hardwired with a new opportunity to, to hear the Spirit in new, fresher ways, to understand Scripture in a way that anybody can understand it because God is working through us and in us. And I think we have to remember that God's desire to see the life of Jesus work its way out of us each and every day. Wrap this up. Three applications for what we've learned. This is homework. There'll be a quiz next week. We'll have, have gift cards for you. Russ will get some gift cards for everybody. A couple of questions for you. Is your identity before God is being justified, is it changing your life? This past week, when you look back, have you run into something and go, you know what, I, my identity is not in me. My identity is not as a Republican or a Democrat or this or that or whatever. Something that can be changed, something that's man-made, that's going to have ups and downs. No, 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 no. My identity is rock solid on Jesus Christ. And because my identity is rock solid... It is an unshakable kingdom because my king can't be shaken. Therefore, tomorrow is going to be better. Circumstances are not going to give me my identity. The finished work of Jesus Christ is. That is something we all need to think and pray through. Next one. When suffering hits, do we try and run from it? Mask it with comfort? Being guilty of both of those. Or embrace the genesis of Christian development? Those are three options, and I'll be honest with you. I've chosen A and B a couple of times. C doesn't feel good. C initially has a bunch of yuck up in there. It has a bunch of sleepless nights, but I'm going to promise you this, church. C is one of the most beautiful things that can ever happen in the Christian life. When you walk through those valleys and you allow him to justify you, not yourself, it is one of those beautiful things that will ever happen in your life. Last one. Do you believe God's timing is perfect and all of our circumstances are rigged? I will tell you this. In my life, that is one of the most challenging questions that I have to answer over and over and over. And the one thing I want to leave you with is this. 
even though we are justified and we're on a trajectory of Christian development, that trajectory sometimes has um, what I would say workarounds or recesses where we fail, right? Where we don't do what we should do, where we do doubt. I think a lot of it is, I love when you're on flight with Delta where they show your little plane and where you're going, you know? So that's your trajectory. You know, that, that's what you see on the Delta little app, right? You see the trajectory. What they don't show on that is if there's a thunderstorm once in a while, the pilot's got to fly around. They don't show that on the trajectory. That's what happens in our lives. So I don't want anybody out of here going, okay, well, I know I sinned last, last Wednesday, so that doesn't mean I'm justified or I'm not saved. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what the Bible is saying. What the Bible is saying is this. We as Christians know where our identity is we Christians know the product that that object has given us. And even when we fail, even when we suffer, or even more importantly in victory, we're going to give ourselves to celebrating Jesus' work in our life. When we can answer those three things with yes and amen, gospel certainty ain't going to be a theory in our lives, right? Gospel certainty is going to be a fact, just like it is getting hot outside. That's what God wants us in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for forgiveness of past sins. Thank you for a hopeful certainty of tomorrow, God. We pray that, um, I pray that, that being justified is more than just a Christian term to memorize or a big word to think through or to talk about even later. I pray that it would be the identity that marks us justified Christians based on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and let that empower your church, God, to go forward um, in salt and light to build your kingdom, God. We love you. We thank you for your grace in our lives. Amen.